Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Saldana. I'm the executive director of New York Tech Alliance. Um, we're a nonprofit organization here in New York City that works to create a connected and equitable ecosystem, uh, tech ecosystem here in New York. Um, we're most known for our um, flagship event, the New York Tech Meetup, uh, where we showcase technology um, to a room full of technologists, uh, currently in a virtual room. Um, but our next one is on June 2nd, uh, so I encourage you to check it out. Um, if you want to learn more about the, our organization and the work that we do, uh, please check out our website, nytech.org. Um, before we begin today's event, I just have a few quick housekeeping and thank yous uh, to do, and then I'll turn it over to Michal Baldwin, uh, the moderator for the event, um, and he will uh, proceed with the conversation with Andy. Um, so get your questions ready. Uh, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we will be video recording or recording this session. So um, if you don't want your face uh, shared or you don't want your voice shared on the recording, um, feel free to just submit your questions through the chat. Otherwise, we really do encourage you uh, to show your face and, and ask your question um, uh, in the video uh, chat. Hey, so I want you to eat a fruit. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. So uh, again, thank you to all of our wonderful annual partners who make the work that we do possible. Um, everybody from Xander to uh, the CEO's right hand, Propeller, with them, uh, Work Better, and Verizon. Um, if you're interested in supporting the organization, please feel free to reach out to me uh, after this event. Um, a very special thank you to our annual partner, Grasshopper Bank, uh, for helping support this, uh, this series, as well as the work that we do in general. Um, they're a really fantastic uh, bank serving founders and their companies, uh, so check them out. Um, Miha is with Grasshopper, so if you have any questions regarding uh, specifically Grasshopper Bank, feel free to reach out. Um, and then our next upcoming events, uh, as I mentioned, on Tuesday, June the 2nd, we will be our next New York Tech Meetup. Um, we're going to be celebrating immigrant founders. Uh, we have uh, received a number of applications from really fantastic founders, so I'll be um, picking those out this week and um, putting them live on our website uh, next week, and we hope that you can join us on June 2nd uh, to see the work that they're doing in the community. Um, on Thursday, June 4th, will be our next installment of this series, uh, Don't Panic, Let's Talk. Uh, we have pivoted a little bit, so we're spotlighting um, amazing founders that are, are making it work during this time. Um, we've selected our next uh, founder, and we will be pushing that out um, later this week as well. Um, and then on Thursday, June the 11th at noon, um, we are doing the next uh, event in our um, Founders Forums a series uh, focusing on uh, venture debt and is that an option uh, during this current um, current uh, time. Um, so we hope that you join us for um, any of these events, all of these events. Uh, they're really fantastic and um, they're here to support uh, your needs. Um, and then with that, I'm going to turn it over to Miha uh, and let you introduce yourself and then let Annie introduce herself and take the conversation away. I'm going to turn off my camera and um, mute myself, but or actually just mute myself and I'll be around. Thank you so much, Miha. Take it away. Thanks, Andy. Uh, well, we've got a good group of folks here today, so I'm excited, uh, especially excited to talk to Annie. Um, the concept of today is really to do two things is one is to talk about uh, a, a talk with a founder and a company that sort of had to make a major shift uh, because of COVID um, and did and figured out some interesting ways to be successful and move their business forward. Um, we don't want it to be just a conversation about one company's success, but we hope that it'll be things that you'll be able to pull from that conversation um, and be able to apply to your own business. Uh, in order to make that work, this has to be super informal uh, and interactive. And so if there are moments where you have questions, uh, comments, or concerns that you'd like to bring up, simply either raise your hand using the raise hand button so the little blue hand comes up, or raise your hand on your video. I'll try to keep my eye on, on everybody uh, as we go. Um, again, uh, the important thing here is that this is a very open time and a very, a very uh, uh, vulnerable time for many people that, that there are a lot of challenges facing businesses, some very large, some very small. Uh, some businesses are doing very well because of the situation and some people aren't doing quite as well. Um, but in the midst of all that, what makes founders 
founders is that they figure it out and they figure out ways to, to navigate and, um, and find a path that helps their business go down a direction that they, that they can go, that they go that's well, um, as I try to use language at, eight, at nine o'clock in the morning on the, on the West Coast, uh, it's always a difficulty for me. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the thing that, that I think is most interesting about founders and, and, and as background, longtime founder, I started my first company when I was a kid. I sold my last company in 2014. Uh, now I'm helping build Grasshopper Bank, which you know is how do you do banking right for startups. Um, at the end of the day, the ability to problem solve is always forefront to the founders that are able to show resilience and be successful in the times of difficulty. Our hope is that you come away with this with at least one learning that helps you figure it out for your business. Um, and if not, at least feel good that, uh, that you got to hang out with some fun people for a little while. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce you to Annie who will do her own introduction um, because I suck at introductions. And she will talk about the table less traveled and a little bit about her journey to date. So Annie, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Miha. Um, nice to be here today and to meet all of you. And like Miha, I'm in Seattle and my West Coast brain at 9 a.m. doesn't work that well. So excuse me if I don't make any sense. Um, and I agree, I'd love this to be conversational. So if you have any questions along the way, I'd be happy to answer them. And um, I, I wanna figure out how this can add value to you. Um, as Miha mentioned, my name is Annie Chang. I'm the founder of The Table Less Traveled. And normally what we would be doing is traveling around the world. We host and curate boutique tours of six to 12 people. And our emphasis is on learning about the local culture through food and culinary experiences. And particularly going into people's homes to have meals, um, visiting small farms and small producers to see how different products are made. And well, Sorry, <laughs> I'm still getting used to Zoom. You would think I'm used to it now. Um, seeing how different products are made and doing cooking classes in local homes across the world. Our emphasis is on Italy, Peru, Malaysia, and Japan. And um, I founded this company five years ago. It's completely bootstrapped. I started this because I had a passion and a love for experiencing different cultures and meeting people and learning about their journeys and their lives. And obviously during this time as a business, we've been hit very hard. Um, you know, it was like overnight, all of a sudden, the main value that we add to customers was completely annihilated. And with that, our expenses continued, uh, all of our overhead, the vendors that we had already paid, um, and I really wanted to focus on how can we create value, uh, maintain our business, support the partners and individuals that we work with around the world and continue paying our employees. And it was quite the journey, but um, I came up with this idea of doing live virtual interactive cooking classes with the chefs and friends that we work with around the world. And, um, you know, we, we our kind of angle that I think is different than what I had seen out there in the marketplace at that time was really the interactive nature of it and trying to mirror the shared experiences that we have overseas um, from own home. And, and I think that's a beautiful part of what we've gotten feedback from people on that they love the cultural exchange that happens and the interactive nature of the classes. And Mika took a class with us last weekend. He made alpha horus, which are cookies from Peru. He did. It was super fun. I, um, uh, they, when, as background, uh, a few years ago, I guess maybe five years ago now, a friend of mine got married in Argentina and we flew down, uh, to Argentina to this wedding on, a. a you know, like a farm. It was just, it was really nice. It was a very small number of people. It was like 30 people, I think. And they had these cookies, which are like these caramel cookies between two um, almost sugar cookie-ish type setup. Um, and I love them. And I've always searched for them. I didn't realize that they were Peruvian, not uh, Argentinian. And so when I saw that class, I was very excited to take it. The interesting thing about the class, which 
um, which I'd love to learn more in terms of around the business was that there was a lot of conversation about Peru and about education. And is that, is that something that you found is unique for the, for the travel that you did prior um, was really about learning about the area and really um, diving in deep to the culture of the, of the travel? Yeah, I, I think that one of the, one of the interesting things is like, we have three goals as a company that kind of support our mission. And one of those goals is to package our trips in this easy, accessible trip where you're kind of handheld and picked up at the airport and you don't really have to think through anything, like everything's taken care of for you. And the reason that we do that is because we want it to be an experience where you can be very present and you can absorb and have some hopefully transformative experiences by learning about what they live like, what their history is, you know, what's important to them and why. And I think that we try to emphasize that in like kind of the undertones of what we do. So for example, in Peru, we go to the Mara salt mines, which is actually a fairly popular tourist destination. And the salt pans are basically, there's a, a very small spring in this huge valley and um, families have created these different pools of salt where then the water evaporates and they can sell the salt in the local markets. And I think the interesting thing is that <clears throat> from a tourist standpoint, you look at it and it's really beautiful. If you search Mara salt mines on Instagram, you are going to be bombarded with these gorgeous pictures of like, you know, the Instagram selfie travel picture. Um, but I think what people walk away with when we have the depth of knowledge and more history and culture is like the understanding that these are owned by families that support their livelihoods, the history behind it. And not everybody has that opportunity because they don't get to meet the family who owns the salt pan. And that's really where we try to emphasize the educational portion of the exchange. Yeah, what I thought was really interesting in the class was it was from the chef's own kitchen, like it was in his house. Um, and, and one of the, the folks that works for you translated. So there was a lot of back and forth in, in Spanish and English. Um, and his dogs were running around and we talked about what it was like to live in COVID in Peru. You know, they have a, a curfew at six o'clock where the police sort of patrol afterwards and are not allowed out. It's a much different situation than it is for us. But he talked about how um, the tourist industry was really the primary driver of revenue for a lot of the, the folks um, in Peru and that 90% of their tourism was from the US and that had evaporated. Um, do they, did you come up with the idea of doing the cooking classes as a way uh, to continue to support uh, the local communities? Yeah, I would say that um, kind of the story and structure around how we came up with the cooking classes and how we've structured it from a financial perspective might be interesting to people. Um, I mentioned those three goals that we have, and one of them is also to support small businesses and independent um, freelancers, more or less, guides and chefs and individuals that we work with around the world. So that's a core part of what our mission is as a company. <clears throat> and we knew as soon as this started happening and we had to start postponing trips that, um, you know, the people that we work with around the world were going to be significantly impacted by this, especially in Italy and Peru, where their primary industries are travel and they rely on our tourism. And when I came up with this idea, I, it was like, well, there were a lot of ideas I was throwing around, but this is the one that I settled on that I thought you know, did three things for us. First, it aligned with our values and our mission. The second was, I thought we were uniquely positioned to do something like this. And it had an intrinsic value that we would be able to provide to people who were participating in the classes. And so when I started calling my friends from around the world, um, you know, I got on the phone with them and I was like, I have this crazy idea. I know you're stuck at home. How, how's your life? Like there, there were a lot of tears. There was a lot of crying. And, um, you know, I was like, I'd love to do this. Would you be on board for cooking a class or teaching a cooking class from your home kitchen interactive on zoom? And I was like, I, I have no idea what this, how to structure this. Like, 
what people would be willing to pay or how much we should pay you. And I want to do this so that we can support you as individuals who can't work during this time. Um, like what would be reasonable? Can you give me a ballpark so that we can make sure that we can cover the overhead? And it was astounding to me that across the country or like across the world, the people that I talked to in Peru and Italy were the ones that I talked to first. There was a common theme and they told me, Annie, this is not about the money. This is about humanity. Let's do this and let's see if it works. And if it does, then we'll worry about the money later. And I was just floored. I mean, these people were struggling to pay rent. They were struggling to buy groceries for their families, to buy diapers for their two-year-olds. And here they were being so generous with their time and their expertise and the value that they can bring to the world. And at that time, I decided that what we would do if they were willing to take that risk uh, with us of like, we have no idea whether or not this will work is to have them be um, shareholders in it basically. And so we pay 50% of the proceeds of all classes directly back to each of the chefs. And the model that we adapted, adopted for participants is a pay what you can price plan. So people who are able to afford more and contribute more can and those who can't because they're also losing jobs or um, you know, having a very difficult time right now, we wanted to give them the option to still participate and to be a part of the community and not limit them because of their financial restraints. Awesome. We have a question from the audience. Um, our Tao. If, uh, Hello. If uh, yes, uh, I have a quick question, which is you um, founded your business five years ago. And I'm just curious, what has growth been like for you before this event? and uh, what do you anticipate growth will be like after? And then this kind of pivot that you did, this model, it's kind of a shift in business model. I'm just wondering um, kind of what do you see will happen now that you've implemented this model? If it's successful, do you imagine that you'll pivot to that permanently or um, is it kind of a stopgap currently for you know the current situation? And if there's any sense you can provide on what your business is like in terms of number of, of, of employees or just kind of some more statistics would be really helpful if that's possible to share. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. Those are all good questions. I'm going to try to remember and hit all of them. So if I, if I don't, please remind me. Um, for a little bit of background, um, we, I, I founded this company in the very beginning of 2015. It was extremely scrappy. Um, I had this idea kind of similar that I, I found so much value in meeting and interacting with people overseas. And I had no idea that when other people traveled, they would like go to the Coliseum to take a tour and stay in a hotel. And that was the extent of their experience that they didn't really have any, as I call it, like insider access, like somebody hosting them or taking care of them or showing them where, you know, their favorite restaurant is or things like that. And so I really wanted to build those bridges for people. Um, and so I started with uh, the destination of Malaysia because my dad grew up in a small town there and we had a lot of family connections. And I knew if we were gonna, if I was gonna do this and it was gonna be successful, it had to be places where we had relationships and connections. Um, and so I launched my first trip in September of 2015. And the first nine months were pretty much just like trying to market. But I'll tell you, honestly, like I had no marketing budget and I also couldn't compete for AdWords on travel space. And like, if I showed up next to REI Adventures, who the hell is going to trust the table as travels because they don't know who we are. We had no brand recognition. And so it was a, it was a long struggle. My first trip was all friends and family. And, you know, from there it grew, we grew part partnerships with other companies that were aligned with the types of experiences that we um, that we did and worked with them to build a customer base that would be interested in our overseas experiences. And I will, let's see, in 2017, I think, I hired my first part-time employee. Maybe that was, no, first was in 2018. And it was mostly a scramble. Like I... At that point, 
we grew 2x in revenue from 2017 to 2018. And a huge portion of that growth was actually because we started doing what, what I call custom travel planning. People who were saying, hey, we really love what your group trip to Peru looks like. Can you make something specific for my family or my fiance and me or whatever? And that was 50% of our revenue from 2017 to 2019. But the thing is, I realized in 2019, I freaking hated that part of our business. It was the thing that I never wanted to do. It was the thing that nobody on my team ever wanted to do. Um, and quite frankly, it, it just wasn't profitable enough. Like we were spending probably 70% of our time in overhead doing this travel planning service that also, people didn't get the same value out of it as our, our group travel clients who shared experiences with us and each other and built this sense of community. We weren't there to make introductions and introduce them to friends and give them insider access when we were sitting behind a computer. We were basically a glorified travel agent. So in 2000, at the end of 2019, I made the bold decision to half our revenue for 2020 and beyond and say, we're not going to do this service anymore. Um, coincidentally, <laughs> uh, COVID hit right after that pretty much. And so we still have a few trips that we had planned and we're, you know, still trying to figure out how to postpone or delay those trips for existing clients and travelers. Um, but it's definitely been a journey. And in terms of where we were for the first time in two years, we were selling out trips in 2020. We were being found on Google organic search. Um, we had enough money that I could finally afford some marketing strategists to look at, like, how are we finding the right people who fit within our audience who would value our uh, products and services? And we had a pretty aggressive plan to scale from six trips a year in 2020 to 16 trips in 2021. Um, I was in the process. At, at that time, I had one full-time employee and a couple of contractors who were helping with, like, marketing and bookkeeping. And at that time, I was about to hire a second full-time employee. Um, and, and then we had a plan to hire a third full-time employee to support in the fall of 2020 and um, tour hosts for 2021 as contractors. And uh, my second full-time employee was supposed to start on March 15th, and she was going to relocate from Hawaii to Seattle. And... Um, when we postponed our trip to Malaysia that was due in March, I said, hey, I still really want to hire you, but I have no idea what's happening. And I also really don't know if you want to be moving into the hotspot of Seattle. Can you take a pause and can we take some time to think through um, and see what happens within the next couple of weeks? Did Oh, and the other question you had was about the um, product service and how we see it moving forward. So to be quite honest with you, I haven't had a ton of time to be thinking through like vision and what's happening over the next couple of months, although we've started to go there and we're actually having an all team meeting to work on some of that vision and strategy in the next couple of weeks. Um, but I think that it's really about the cooking classes themselves. I've realized that it has opened up our community and allowed people to participate in cultural exchange in a form of travel that wouldn't have necessarily been able to join us on one of our trips because they're not inexpensive. It's, it's time consuming, like you have to have time off to do it and you have to have disposable income to afford it. And so this is a way that we can still provide that value and the mission of sharing experiences together um, with an audience that we wouldn't have necessarily been able to provide value to before. So I'm hoping that if the demand continues for these virtual interactive classes, that we will continue working with chefs around the world and our friends here to provide them. Um, and I think that the other part of it is I've become very aware of the fact that uh, international travel is not going to rebound quickly. I mean, it, it sounds like it may be years before people feel comfortable with that type of travel. And so not only are we trying to figure out how can we do that in the safest way possible, and I think we're actually well suited for that to some degree because our trips were always so intimate and small, 
Um, you know, we don't have like a 50 person bus rolling through the streets and then jumping into the Vatican where they have 15,000 visitors a day. So that's one nice thing. Like we're mostly in small homes and um, local places. So we don't have, we have some advantage there. But I think what we're really focusing on right now in terms of vision is what's the in-between, between between that time when the majority of the population is still happy doing virtual interactive classes and when they're ready to travel internationally again. So pre-COVID, we actually had some ideas about um, expanding the types of experiences that we have to a shorter time frame on a domestic basis with other um, like farmers who learned their techniques from Peru and cultural experiences that exist within the U.S. So I think that that's probably the next place that we'll go in terms of adding more products and services that are time relevant and also would provide value to people. Did I answer all the questions? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, We have another question from Jeremy. Hey Annie, thanks so much. Uh, I'm Jeremy Shore, I'm with Grasshopper Bank as well. Um, It's been great to hear from you today and congratulations on on the successful pivot. Um, I'm wondering, Many companies that we speak to are are thinking about how to pivot parts of their business, parts of their offering, their product, their go-to-market strategy, uh, particularly related to COVID. Are there any things that you wish you'd been told in advance as you executed on your pivot? Or are there any experiences that you draw upon that you would share as advice for founders that are thinking about executing the pivot? What are kind of those those key things that from your experience that you, you, what advice would you give? Um, and what advice do you wish you, you had heard? That's, before you did it? That's a great question. Um, to give you some perspective, I came up with this idea on March 11th. I started calling chefs and friends of ours around the world on March 12th. And we launched our first test class on March 18th and went live with the full product service on our calendar, on our website, on March 18th and did our first class on March 20th. Wow. That was, wow. Yeah. I didn't really sleep. (laughs) And our, um, coincidentally, my, my part-time employee who was with me at the longest then was on vacation and our, um, social media marketing person was also on vacation. So I was like, okay, how do I do this? Um, but it worked. And I think part of it was like the lessons that I've, I've learned a lot, um, a lot over the last two months. But I think one of the things that was a key takeaway for me is that I'm such a perfectionist. I care so much. I care too much actually about the user experience in my mind. Like it is so hard for me to let go of anything. And I think that's why up until this time, I had always been the one that was so closely um, hosting and curating all of the trips that we do. I knew every single customer that we had personally and intimately. We were friends. I still consider them friends. Um, And so when I started doing this, I realized that if we were going to make a change and we were going to make a change quickly, I needed to learn to let go of some stuff. And I needed to learn that it was okay for it to not be a complete perfect product, but to just freaking get it out there and, it, and, and learn as we go and let our customers educate us on what works well for them and what doesn't work well for them. So I was aggressive about feedback from the very beginning of this. And I think we've made a lot of changes. It's an iterative process. I actually had a friend who was on that very first experimental one that we did and she was like yeah that was great I loved it but like there's all these issues you know like I I, you know the registration was clunky and like I didn't know what ingredients I was supposed to have or could I have had different ingredients or I couldn't get flour what do I do instead and now she took a class actually this week um, and she was like oh my gosh the experience was so much more seamless like of course there's always places where we can improve and we're getting better and more feedback from everybody that's helping us um, improve but it was interesting for me to learn like sometimes you just gotta go with what you have and learn as you go instead of like what's that saying 
done and good is better than perfect and undone or something like that. Like that, that's me. I hold on to stuff. Um, so that's something that I definitely in this time where I think it was Mika or maybe Andy who was saying people seem to be a little bit more forgiving. If you're going to experiment or try something, I think that this is the perfect time when people are forgiving for those things that aren't, um, you know, the seamless experience that you're envisioning in your mind. And as far as other advice I wish I'd been given or advice that I'd gotten, I think it's almost the opposite for me. I called a lot of friends and people that I knew um, who I really respect, especially people that are like in media and marketing to understand what, what they thought about this proposition. And I received a lot of feedback from them that was like, oh yeah, this is, this is never going to sell. Like you, you can do it for $0 like a YouTube tutorial. Nobody's going to turn their video on. Nobody wants their face to be seen in their homes. Like, and normally when somebody tells me something like that, I just take it to be the truth. And I'm like that. Yeah, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. You know? And I think part of this learning experience for me was actually seeing that other people's advice is just that it's advice, but I have to lean into what I trust and what I think is right. And whether or not that ends up being the case, I have to experiment with what I feel instead of relying on somebody else's opinion to be the spoken truth of how something's going to happen. Because in reality, nobody knows what's going to happen. I mean, nobody, well, maybe there were people who saw this coming, but I think the vast majority of us did not. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that answer. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Carl put a good uh, a quote in the chat if you guys want to take a look at that. Um, so let's let's go back to when everything starts to happen, right? Like you start to hear about uh, lockdowns and travel bans and and all these various things. What was your mental state at that point? What was the first thing you thought of? when you started to hear that, that potentially your business was going to be drastically affected by what was going on. Am I allowed to swear on this? Yeah. It was fucking disastrous. Like I, you know, I, it was like such an emotional roller coaster. I'm sure all of you have been through it. It, it was like a complete grief and loss. And I had to go through the cycles of grief. I felt, I felt like I was, going to lose this baby that I have cherished and poured my whole life into and made so many sacrifices for. And we were finally getting to a place where like, it felt like all the things that we had done were starting to pay off. I was learning all of these lessons that were finally starting to pay off. You know, we went through a lot of really hard times in 2018 and 2019. And I felt like, wow, we're, we're on the path forward. You know, we're selling out trips and we've got good cash flow, and like, we're, we're getting there. And this just knocked me off my feet. Like I, you know, the first couple of weeks, I just would go through these waves, um, especially as I was working on this idea because I had this fluctuation between sheer sadness with the possibility that we would lose everything, that I would have to lay off my employees, that, you know, the partners that we work with around the world would not be financially sound enough to still be there when we were returned to travel. It was just heartbreaking. And then the, on the other side of it, there was just this overwhelming generosity that was coming forth from people and understanding and compassion that was like, made me so happy in some ways that we were finding ways as a society and a community to come together. And so to have those two hugely contrasting, very, very high emotion um, situations happening at the same time was completely disorienting. And I was very, very fearful for not just my business, but more importantly to me, my employees and my partners. Who was the first person you reached out to to ask for support and why? Probably my mom. 
Um, and I think it was because it was emotional support. It wasn't, it wasn't support around necessarily like, is this the best business strategy? It was like, I need somebody to listen to me cry and have that be okay. And have them be understanding of the fact that like, I think another feeling that really strongly resonated with me was guilt. And I felt like I was, I felt guilty or shame that I was so upset about this situation for me and for the people who, um, who we support through our business when there were so many other people that were being more drastically hurt in my opinion, like, you know, businesses that really were going out of business overnight or making that choice and laying off hundreds of employees, um, you know, individuals who had COVID and whose families were, family members were dying of COVID. Like I felt so much guilt for the sadness that I felt because I felt there were other people in worse positions. And so to have my mom there, who's somebody who could be like non-judgmental in my emotional roller coaster was really helpful for me to put myself in a productive mindset to think about how to move forward. I needed to process the grief before I could think productively, I think. So you've processed the grief now, which I, I think I appreciate your vulnerability. Um, and, and now you have to make the decision, do I go forward or do I end? Was that ever a, a question in your mind? And how did you make, come up with the answer for yourself? Um, so I go to a lot of therapy. <laughs> and my therapist told me once, and I shared this with my mom yesterday, um, sometimes your hard work and perseverance are more of a liability and I think the reason that he told me that was because I just don't see there being a different path forward. Like when I have my mindset on something, I will do whatever it takes to get there. And sometimes that means really quite unreasonable things. Um, and for me, at least at this point, it's like, I will do this until, until there is absolutely no other option. Um, you know, I care deeply about the people that we work with. And I told my mom who asked me that similar question the other day, like she was helping me with my bookkeeping and she was saying, you know, do you, do you think this is sustainable? Do you think this is viable? Can you continue doing this with, uncertainty of when travel will return. I mean, what we're doing now is great and I love it, but from a business standpoint, from a financial standpoint, it's not nearly as much revenue as we would be generating for the operating expenses that we have on a regular basis. And, um, and she was like, you know, you're suffering, like you're, this is stressful situation. And it, and you go through these daily still swings of the grief and the sadness. She was like, is it worth it? And I was like, you know what? I would feel more stress and more sadness if I gave up and I let down everybody around me. Maybe, maybe that's a drastic statement, but let down the people who are relying on this um, because it was too hard. One of the questions that came in through the sign up was, um, and, and I'm gonna pivot a little bit towards tactical things. Um, so you went through a process where you said, okay, had my grief, life sucks, business is having problems. I'm gonna figure this out. What was the first thing you did as you started to go down the path of figuring out what your pivot should be? How did you, more specifically, how did you determine that live cooking classes was something that your community wanted? I quite really didn't know whether or not it was something my community wanted. Um, and I think that that's where my question mark came in. But I started thinking, I mean, I came up with a number of ideas. I came up with this idea of like, could I do something almost like HelloFresh, but different where it was like, we would package ingredients from the small vendors, um, you know, like the, 
the family that owns an Achataya in Modena, which is like where you get balsamic vinegar, but like the real stuff, the good stuff. Could we package his products with like really good Parmigiano Reggiano and send it out to people with some sort of recipe on how they could make this? Um, you know, I had thought about maybe we could do something similar like that, but with local companies and local producers and, and then have a chef tutorial, like a YouTube tutorial on a flash drive that we send to somebody to show them how to make the thing. Um, but I think that it was, it was like initially just a lot of brainstorming, not, not specific brainstorming. Like, it's not like I sat down and had structure and was like, I'm going to brainstorm now. It was like, no, I'd be driving down the road and I'm like, ah, <laughs> um, but when I settled on virtual cooking classes and really like the interactive cooking classes, was when I was toying with all of these ideas, I really thought through what are we uniquely positioned to do that adds intrinsic value in some way and supports our mission and goals. And when I thought through those things, I basically evaluated all of our ideas against those three criteria. And I was like, okay, we are not positioned to be HelloFresh. Like, do you know how much that takes in terms of logistics management? I was like researching wholesale agreements and importing and how to portion out products. And like, coincidentally, my, my dad does own a um, food manufacturing company. So I could have used his facility, but I was like, I don't know how to do that. And like gloves and masks and no. So I, that's when I realized like what we're uniquely positioned to do is what we're already doing, which is sharing the relationships and the experiences with the people that we know around the world. And just because we can't do that by going to visit them doesn't mean that they can't come to visit us in some way and have that cultural exchange. So the most important thing for me was really measuring it against those three items. Uh, awesome. We have another question from the audience. Artel. Hey, yes, um, just building off of that question, uh, I'm just curious in terms of the skills that you've had to kind of learn or um, going into it, it seems that you had a great foundation of, of, of a network and skills to found your business. And I'm just curious um, if you have any advice on if looking back at your experience now, what kind of skills do you think you would have wanted to beef up and then in in, um, in the same vein when you had to pivot to kind of this more digital approach um, did you find that kind of looking more at yeah it was funny because you mentioned UX and when I think of UX I traditionally kind of uh, associate that with a website or a platform but you know you're really talking about customer engagement and that's such a big component of your business and I'm just wondering if you could touch based on kind of uh, the skills that have been most helpful to you the gaps that you've had and how you've solved that, whether that's through consultants or whatnot, and where you think it might kind of go in the future um, for you. Thanks. That's a great question. Holy cow. Um, so many skills that I'm missing. Let's start there. <laughs> um, so many skills I missed in the past and so many I'm missing now and will continue to miss in the future. Um, but I think, I think when we talk about the past, I think the skills that I missed the most, to be honest with you, were, were um, the ability to delegate and to truly let go and to trust others. Um, because there were so many things that I was not good at. Like I was not good at actual UX, like on the website that you're talking about. And like, how does a user go through and experience that? I'm not good at marketing. Like I'm just, number one, I hate doing it. Number two, it doesn't make sense to me. Like data data makes sense in and of itself, but how people draw correlations and causations where I'm like, I don't necessarily know that that's causation. Like that is challenging for me. And so it's very hard for me to make decisive moves when it comes to marketing. And I think the biggest whole, what was holding me back the most was the really big risk and financial fear of investing in those areas because it was like, not only would I not know them, so I have not a lot of strength to monitor or manage whether or not it's being done well, uh, but it's also a huge financial risk. Like it's a lot of money to be paying somebody else who's an expert in one of those areas. And 
I think the same thing applies to what we're doing right now. And an interesting thing in terms of the shift that we've taken is that, yes, you're right. Our user experience was completely in person. I did work with a team of students at General Assembly a few years ago who did like a UX on our website and we completely redid our website. And part of it was because they were like, well, the customers that you're talking to can't even find your information. And I was like, but nobody goes to our website. And they were like, yeah, because your website sucks. <laughs> so it was like this whole shift for us that our website used to only be a place where people would come for validation that we were a company that existed, that ran trips, that was going to not just take their money and run away with it. Um, and what it's become is really a place where people find us and engage and then have to go through a process of purchasing. And we're still definitely in an iterative version of what we want to get to in terms of allowing people to easily search and find for what they're looking for. Um, but I think in terms of skill sets, another thing that I've realized, and um, I don't know if any of you you are familiar with EO Entrepreneurs Organization, but they've been an amazing help for me in my journey. And I've learned so much through that program that I've been in for the last year and a half. And one of the things that I walked away with was I need to build a team of people who are better than me at the things that I'm not good at. And now when I go into a hiring process with somebody, I'm very explicit about that. And I say, hey, I want to lead by example in some ways, but I'm going to tell you right now, what I need is I need you to lead me by example. I need you to teach me, you know, can you do this or can you do that so that we have people in our organization who are way better than me at building a website, at running social media, at looking at the data and analytics. And I think that that is really a turning point for us in terms of our organization and hopefully in the future, our ability to scale again. Thank you. Um, well, let's talk, we're, we're about 15 minutes left or so, maybe 10. So I always like to talk about, about you know, positive things, like let's end this on, on relatively positive notes. And it's been great so far, but, but let's get more specific. Tell me something that you're really proud of that occurred during this pivot. Um, when you asked that question to Allie, because I was on the last uh, session, it was like immediately I knew what my answer would be and it hasn't changed. And that is that I am most proud of our team. Um, and even just saying that word gives me chills because for so long in my company, it was like a struggle to even get to the point mentally for me where I could hire one person and feel okay about that. And even that, it was a one-to-one -one relationship. Like we have a line between us. And I am so grateful that through these cooking classes, and I'm sorry, my team is now online and so I'm getting blown up on Slack and email. Um, yep, I'm, I don't know how to turn that off though. Hold on a second. All right. I can't. It's okay. We'll just we'll struggle going. through. Yeah. <laughs> We're all, we're all used. I was just thinking, you know, that uh, at this point from working from home for so long that I can tell you the difference between whether it's an email, a Slack message, Discord, right? Like whatever it is. <laughs> so, so the emails you're getting, I get it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that now it's like we, we, I'm grateful that because of these cooking classes, we were able to bring on the employee that I had mentioned that was going to start working in March. Um, she actually started working on April 6th with us. Um, so she is working from her home in Hawaii. And we, we have hired two more contractors to help support our live cooking classes and hosting them. Um, and we've increased the number of hours that our social media manager has been working. And so now we have a team. We have a team of five people. We went from two to five within three months, essentially. Um, I, I, I guess our social media manager was there, but she was only working like five hours a week. So now she's an integral part of the team. And the audience that we speak to is definitely one where we can engage online and through social media, whereas before our audience didn't really engage with us in that way. And I think the thing that I'm most proud of is that like, A, we have a team. Um, to be able to pay those people means the world to me right now. Um, 
be that our team is like unimaginable. Like I, I n never thought that I would be able to find such a players and put them all together in a virtual room and see each of them shine in their talents, which goes back to our Tao. Cause I don't know your real names um, statement and question and having them run in areas where they're so much better than me is so freeing and I've learned so much from having a team and letting go and trusting them and I'm so so grateful for our team and proud of everything that they've done they're passionate and they're hard workers and they're driven and I'm so happy to have their support right now so let's get selfish for a minute as a founder what's one thing that you're proud of that you accomplished over the last couple months um Oh, that's a harder question. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, I think it's that I'm really proud that we have stuck by our mission and have not been advantageous and opportunistic in kind of negative ways, if that makes sense. Like, I think that there was, and still is space to, um, profit off of what's happening right now in a way that is not necessarily for the highest good. And I'm very proud that I think what we're delivering brings real value and supports real lives. And I'm, I'm happy that I was able to, um, you know, like bird this brainchild in the car one day. <laughs> that's awesome. And what's the best thing that's happened in the last week? Uh, the best thing that's happened in the last week, this. <laughs> There's gotta be something better with the business. I'm glad, okay. but thank you. But with like with your business. business. Um, we're working on some key partnerships with um, some social media channels that want to feature what we're doing and um, share this with their audience of people who might be interested in participating in our classes. And that's, that's really empowering for us to, to see that people think it's valuable and want to share it. And if you were to want, um, if you were to look forward, you know, 12, 24 months, what does your business look like? Oh. <laughs> That's a hard question. <laughs> you know, I, wow, Mika, these are the hardest questions. I was closing <laughs> with them. They're making me nervous. <laughs> um, I would say 12 to 24 months from now, I would really like us to be back traveling internationally. I know it's going to look very different. We've already been talking with our partners about um, how to create more safe spaces for people. I'd like our cooking classes to continue. Um, I'd like to have another two or three products or services that fit well within the realm of what we do and how we provide value. Um, honestly, I'd like it to be more profitable so that we can continue supporting and have enough cash flow and saved in the bank that we you know, if, if something like this happens again, we have the safety and the runway to make it through. Um, and I'd like to hire more people. I'd like to have a bigger team and, and people who are really passionate about the vision that we have. It's really hard for founders to think about the positives. So, so you said these are hard questions. It isn't surprising. And, um, and I like to end with them because I think it's important for us to remember that we chose this life, right? And that, that we're founders because we were born as founders. Um, and there was something in us that made us wanna grow businesses and face the challenges. And, and in that, we have a tendency to wanna to think about how to fix everything. We rarely take a moment just to think about all the positives. So, um, so I appreciate you going on the journey of a little bit of positivity. Uh, I, I appreciate you being vulnerable and open about your process. Um, I do think it's important uh, for us to leave this with uh, what is the one thing that you want people to take away from your story? As founders, I think it's a different thing than um, it might be in a general sense. But I think the one thing that I want people to take away is like really thinking about 
what are you uniquely positioned to do that provides intrinsic value that still aligns with your mission? Great. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Ann, or to Andy. I'm going to thank Ann E for your time. Uh, I appreciate it. I know it's early for you as it's early for me. Um, but we always enjoy these opportunities to talk to founders that are sort of figuring it out as, as we go along. And I will definitely be taking more classes. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you Andy. so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Um, again, another amazing session and really fantastic uh, insights from Annie and Miha both. Um, I'm struggling with the same things in our in our business um, of how to pivot to virtual events, how to um, create that same uh, level of value for our audience and provide uh, the same uh, and make sure that we're still aligning with our mission um, as a nonprofit. So all of this was really insightful. I could probably pick your brain for another three hours. Um, so I, I definitely will connect with you offline. To everybody else in the room, thank you again so much for all of uh, for being a participant, uh, asking such wonderful questions. Um, I've put our contact information up on the screen here. So please feel free to reach out to any of us with any questions regarding um, New York Tech Alliance, Grasshopper Bank, to Annie directly, uh, say thank you again and ask your, uh, your specific questions. Um, again, thank you so much. We'll see you at the next uh, session of uh, Don't Panic, Let's Talk. Um, and that will happen on, in two weeks. So thank you and have a great day. <laughs>